And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sherry Wren. For the A. Hamblin Lenton Lecture. This lecture is named for Dr. A. Hamblin Lenton to recognize his contributions to the Congress and the field of surgery. His special surgical interest was oncology and more specifically breast cancer, which led to the creation of the Breast Center at Georgia Baptist Medical Center, now Atlanta Medical Center. His interest extended to the National Forum by service on the Advisory Committee on Cancer Control for the National Cancer Institute and as the president of the National American Cancer Society. Dr. Lenton's service to the Congress began as a young surgeon and he succeeded Dr. B.T. Beasley, the original secretary of the Congress in 1960. He retired as the secretary director of the Congress in 1986. Dr. Lenton passed away on January 13th, 2010, at the age of 93. Dr. Wren is going to talk to us about technical advances in the treatment of pancreatic body tumors. Dr. Wren serves as the Stanford School of Medicine Vice Chair for Surgery, Director of Global Surgery at the Center for Innovation and Global Health, and Director of Surgery at the Palo Alto Veterans Healthcare System. She is honorary professor in the Center of Trauma at the London School of Medicine, Queen Mary University of London. Dr. Wren is a member in the, and in the leadership of numerous national and international organizations. She is currently on the editorial boards of JAMA Surgery, World Journal of Surgery, Journal of Laparoendoscopic Surgery and Advanced Techniques, and EAST, and Central African Journal of Surgery. Her clinical practice is in gastrointestinal malignancy, robotics, and research interests are in surgical outcomes, robotics, cancer, and global humanitarian surgery. Dr. Ran has been a very good colleague for many, many years, and I'm really pleased to have her come up and give this talk. Double fist bump. President Richards and uh, Dr. Srinivasan, thank you so much for this humbling invitation to deliver this lecture. It is so incredible to be at a surgical meeting after more than a year and a half. I actually feel like a new resident giving a presentation again. So when I looked up who Dr. Letton was, I was actually honored to give this. I found out that he was a graduate of Emory Medical School, but obviously to make funds, he had to drive an ambulance at night for a funeral home to pay for his education. He did his residency here at Georgia Baptist. He served his country in World War II. And like me, he became a volunteer for the American Cancer Society. Unlike me though, he rose to be the head of it in 1971. This was a landmark year because President Nixon at that time signed the National Cancer Act which is what actually gave us cancer centers and many of our cancer control um, programs. When he got up from signing the act, he turned and the first person whose hand he shook was actually Dr. Letton. So what an honor to give this. So as you heard, I'm gonna be speaking about technical advances in the treatment of pancreatic body tumors. I do have a conflict of interest to declare. I'm a consultant to Intuitive Surgical. If you look at pancreatic resections by just looking at PubMed, you see three interesting things. The first pancreatic resection that comes up was in 1935. The most re articles are for pancreatic oduodenectomy and distal pancreatectomy doesn't really come into the literature under that mesh term until 1957. So let's look at the history of surgery and especially left-sided pancreatic surgery. So the first pancreatic surgery recorded on a human being that was still alive, as opposed to cadaver studies, was in Germany, and this was for a cyst drainage. I did not know until putting this talk together that ether was actually first used here in Georgia by Crawford Long, because I had always been told it was a Boston thing. That allowed sort of now the explosion of surgical procedures in the late 19th century. There's been this whole debate about wound extruding distal pancreatic resections. You see a report here from the uh, 1866 Indian Medical Journal from a British surgeon where a piece of pancreas had 
extruded from a wound. These are really debated as to whether these were true pancreatic resections. So the first official pancreatic resection was actually done for a retroperitoneal tumor by Trendelenburg in 1882. He did not intend to take out the spleen, but because of bleeding, the spleen then came out with the uh, pancreas. Bill Roth then did a central pancreatectomy in 85. This was then followed by the first excision for cancer in 1889 in Italy. And the first recorded pancreatic body and tail resection that I could find in the United States was by Briggs. And this was actually reported in the St. Louis Medical and Surgical Journal. In their 1902 book, British surgeons Robson and Moynihan, talking about diseases of the pancreas, sort of report what is now the world's literature for solid tumors. They could only find 13 case reports for body and tail cancers. What's very interesting in the faceplate of the book, they actually thank the surgeons of America, recognizing the United States contributions to pancreatic surgeon at that time, and as you can see, they talk about how there is very large blood vessels that are continually encountered and the splenic vessels have to be ligated and the removal of these tumors are seldom practical. I think these are things some of us still struggle with in modern surgery. Finney from Maryland then went on to talk about pancreatic surgery in 1928. There's been a huge difference here. He's talking about hyperinsulinism. What had happened? Insulin was discovered and this entire rush now to discover insulin and tumor secreting insulin. And at this time, they're describing a lateral to medial mobilization, sparing the spleen. And you can see he concludes that removing large portions of the pancreas is a comparatively safe and simple procedure. Fast forward a few years, William Mayo in addressing the American Surgical Association about the state of the art of surgery at the pancreas at that time, uh, kind of doesn't speak much about distal pancreatectomy. This lecture is credited as defining the standard technique of a distal pancreatectomy plus spinectomy, which is that lateral to medial approach or the retrograde approach. But in this paper, he only describes a single left-sided pancreatic tumor resection. And basically he got into a lot of splenic bleeding. He put a bunch of clamps on things. And a few days later, he started removing them. The retrograde approach was actually described in the section on pancreatic injuries during splenectomy instead of for resection for pancreatic disease. Gordon Taylor in 1934 reported a seven year survivor of resection of the pancreas for a cancer. And he did this sort of modified uh, resection. You can see the red line represents where he divided the gland. Ranson, who I think many of us recognize from the Ranson criteria, first started out describing uh, cancers of the body's and tail in 1935. Again, only 16 cases. And if you look at the case list in the table on the slide, there was not a single resection here. These were all operations done for palliation because basically the conclusion was patients didn't really live long enough and maybe you could help them. And needless to say, I think Branson sort of left the area of uh, surgery of, for cancers and moved into pancreas as the primary area of his interests. Brungschwag was sort of the last person for a while who's gonna talk about the surgical treatment of cancers of the pancreas in 1944. He's now summing the world's literature to date, 22 cases, he's adding some of his own. But this is the best representation of sort of the three descriptions of technical approach. The first he talks about is dividing the pancreatic neck, dissecting medial to lateral or antegrade with splenic vein preservation. Second, dividing the pancreatic neck and the splenic artery and vein, now doing your medial to lateral mobilization. This is the antegrade non-splenic sparing. And lastly, the Mayo technique of the lateral to medial where the spleen and tail are elevated and dividing them at last or the retrograde technique. So Cattell of Cattell Brash Maneuver and Warren of Warren Shunt in their 1951 sort of uh, summary in the New England Journal, you can see a huge change here now. The change in the indications is for really pancreatitis and for islet cell tumors. There's no mention here of cancer or cystic tumors. So the field had really kind of evolved away for treatment, primary treatment of cancers. In 
So after nine years of residency, I uh, exited in 1994. This was the uh, atlas of uh, at the time. Um, and you can see that distal pancreatectomy here being shown in the classic Mayo approach, splenic elevating the pancreas in this um, retrograde technique was really only indicated for cystadenocarcinomas and malignant insulinomas. And there really hasn't been any survivors of pan uh, pancreatic cancer but you might be able to palliate people. So when I started my practice after HPB fellowship, this was state of the art. So you may wonder what a slide is showing a picture of 1967 Beatles. I'm sure there's some people in the audience who remember the Beatles, could identify which ones. This is the year of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, album. So what does the Beatles have to do with the pancreas? There was massive, advancements in medical imaging. So in 1967, the American Journal of Radiology deemed the pancreas still the hidden organ. Also in 1967, the electric and musical industries, EMI, the producers or label of the Beatles actually had a lab in which Hounsfield uh, invented the first CT scan. 1970, ultrasound of the pancreas comes about and there's a lot of speculation, it's hard to find any proof of this, that money from the Beatles and how successful they were then went on to sort of literally fund the development of CT scan to the point where the first commercially available CT was in 1972 and the first one came to the United States in 1973. All of us know how CT scans have totally changed how we've practiced medicine. And in 2019, there was just under 100 million scans done in the United States. MRI technology then developed to the point where an incidental pancreatic finding is now one of the most common indications in my clinic for a visit. MRI is much more sensitive at it. It's about 14% of scans now will show an incidental pancreatic finding. Indications for this operation have changed. We've really left the 50s to 90s where it was primarily pancreatitis, functional neuroendocrine tumors, and cyst adenomas. Now it's primarily cystic neoplasms, both functional and non-functional neuroendocrine tumors, IPMNs, and pancreatic ductal cancer. New adjuvant chemotherapy has so changed and has really extended the indications and survivorship of many patients with primary ductal cancer. Also, our techniques have changed. Splenic sparing techniques, vascular resections, the RAMPS procedure, and now minimally invasive laparoscopic and robotic techniques. So let's talk about the splenic sparing. They were described in the late 19th century. It's considered to not be a standard technique for uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, even though it's actually never been studied, but the thought is that you get more lymph nodes if you take the spleen if you have an adenocarcinoma. The benefits to saving the spleen though, is you have fewer post-op abscesses and patients don't have risk for overwhelming post-splenectomy sepsis. This 1985 uh, description of a so-called conservative pancreatectomy here is showing you where they lifted the tail of the pancreas and then divided uh, the tributaries in this lateral to medial, but that was basically abandoned in most cases. And in the series shown here of distal pancreatectomies, you can see almost half of them were splenic sparing, most of them for pancreatitis though. And again, this now goes for the antegrade where you're dividing the gland and then taking the vessels as you move towards the tail. Andy Warshaw in 1988 had a landmark publication for the splenic sparing technique, which now bears his name. He reported on 25 patients, the vast majority of which were pancreatitis. He really identified that you could preserve the spleen by saving the inflow from the short gastrics and the left gastropoploic, you could then divide the splenic artery and splenic vein at the neck and move in this antegrade dissection. And as long as you looked at the spleen, they didn't have a large infarct, that would work out most of the time. Kimura in 1996 also described a splenic sparing technique, again, first for chronic pancreatitis, here, you rotate the uh, pancreas up, you incise over the splenic vein, and then you dissect it free along with the artery going towards the spleen. This is a really nice atlas picture of this. 
where you can see this serial ligation and division of both the splenic vein and artery tributaries finally hitting the tail of the pancreas. This is um, sort of the two choices. So is there any data to show that this makes a difference? So if you look at splenic preservation, it does make a difference if you can save the spleen. Lower rates of infection, lower rates of abscesses, lower morbidity, and no chance for postpenectomy sepsis. Splenic vein preservation or the Kimura technique actually does have a lower rate of splenectomy, lower infarct rate, and less development of gastric varices. The Warshaw technique, lower blood loss, shorter OR times, and there's really no definitive data to show that one technique is better than the other. Your tumor size may influence which technique you use because if you have a smaller tumor, it's much easier to use the Kimura technique um, than if it's a larger tumor. And both techniques have had their roles in both open and minimally invasive surgery. This is a robotic Warshaw from one of my partners. I never filmed my operation, so I had to get that from uh, Brendan, who's an unbelievably good pancreatic surgeon. You can see there's division now. He's preserved the uh, left gastric arcade, coming in, getting the splenic artery out, superiorly on the pancreas here, getting around it. You see the common hepatic artery to the side there, using a vascular staple to uh, divide this. Now moving inferiorly, opening up to see the uh, splenic vein, dissecting out the root of the splenic vein here. Sometimes you have these small tributaries that you have to take. You can see our technique is to use these two of silks to give you better uh, traction to uh, perform stapling or division. Now creating this retropancreatic tunnel after dividing the uh, splenic vein with the stapler. Here's the tunnel getting created. So now the splenic artery and vein have been divided, passing the suture under. Then using a stapler to divide the pancreatic body, you can see the cystic neoplasm to screen left there. Once that's done, it becomes fairly easy to take the remainder. At the end, you divide the splenic artery and vein again, preserving the left gastropoploix. Your specimen will come out and you'll see the splenic viability at the conclusion of this robotic Warshaw procedure. It's a really nice way to do an operation. Let's move on to extended resections now. You can see on the CT here, you have a pancreatic adenocarcinoma encasing the splenic artery and the common hepatic artery. In the past, we would have told this patient that there was nothing that could be done for them except for chemotherapy and maybe some radiation, but now we have more to offer. Sorry, gotta advance, there we go. Appleby, in his description of removing gastric cancers in 1953, discovered that if you had a tumor that was involving to the left side of the SMA, you could treat this with a combined gastric and pancreatic resection. You could ligate the hepatic artery proximal to the gastroduodenal as well as the celiac access. You would get preserved flow through the gastroduodenal and the pancreatic duodenals, and the stomach would get flow through the uh, right gastric artery. Uh, the red lines there sort of predict are uh, showing what that flow pattern would be. This was then extended to pancreatic resections, first in Japan in 1976 by Nomura. There's been an evolution of technical modifications here. Now we do preoperative uh, common hepatic artery embolization sometimes to do preoperative conditioning. We do arterial and venous reconstructions. And there's been two recent meta-analyses that have looked at whether these extended celiac resections have offered any benefit. What do you see, most importantly? Greater three-year survivorship. Needless to say, longer OR times, more bleeding, more portal venous reconstructions, more R-positive resections, longer lengths of stay, more re-operations re and a higher mortality risk. But it is offering a group of patients that it would otherwise have probably somewhere between eight to 12 months of survivorship, a chance at extended survivorship. And this has become a fairly standard operation in many centers. This again is a robotic version of this. So there's a tumor adherent to the confluence. You can see 
can dissect out the mesenteric system, dividing the inferior mesenteric vein, now looping all of uh, the portal, SMV, splenic, placement of endoscopic bulldogs, using the uh, scissors then to excise the tumor where it had actually invaded in this area. The vision with the robot is really outstanding. You can see this very well. Now putting in a um, pericardial graft to uh, patch this. Leaving the graft long enough so you want to tailor it at the end so you can get a more precise um, placement of it. So you can here see the final tailoring of the graft. Finally, finishing the suture closure. The robot does not have haptics, but vision really does make up for this in many ways. Removing the clamps, and you can see the final here where you have the superior mesenteric artery and a nice vein patch. All of that being done minimally invasively. There are people who also do this through a laparoscope. So it's really a technique of your choice. The next technique that came about was uh, the radical antigrade modular pancreaticosplenectomy, otherwise known as the RAMPS procedure in 2003. The goal of this was to really improve the posterior margin clearance where you're at risk for having an R1 resection. Also to improve the nodal dissection. The nodes that you're really trying to get are the celiac nodes, the nodes along the uh, superior mesenteric artery, gastroduodenal nodes, splenic nodes. And the steps here, you divide the pancreatic neck, you take those nodes, you go straight down, you're dividing the artery and the vein, you divide all of that tissue going straight down to the superior mesenteric, you can get the aortic lymph nodes then between the celiac artery and the SMA, you can take the SMA nodes, you then have looked at your imaging and you decide what your posterior margin is gonna be. Are you gonna take the left adrenal with this or not? And then your inferior border of your resection, you see you get down to the left renal vein. So you're taking all of that retroperitoneal tissue that these tumors can invade into and you take gerotus fascia with that. This operation can also be done minimally invasively. So does it show any benefit? So there's data to show that there is one-year survivorship benefit, 78% versus 64. Um, there is similar rates of fistula, so you're not getting more fistulas from this. You definitely have an improved R0 resection. You have an improved lymph node yield. Needless to say, it takes longer. You have more blood loss, but no significant differences in complications, length of stay, or mortality. And there's a lot of clinical interest in this because there's five trials undergoing now from clinical trials gov that you can find, some of them looking at R0 and some looking at overall survivorship. Minimally invasive distal pancreatectomy is increasingly being done in many centers. The first description of this was by Cuchieri in 1996, and it was done for chronic pancreatitis. It was a lap distal splenectomy, a lot, uh, distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy for um, in the same year, Gagné did the first one then, lap distal plus a spleen for a neuroendocrine tumor. Scott Melvin, when at Ohio, did the first robotic uh, distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy for a neuroendocrine tumor. It is really becoming the operation of choice for many tumors and it's actually my preferred approach as long as the tumor characteristics are favorable. There have been two randomized trials, the LEOPARD trial and the LAPOP trial, which looked at minimally invasive distal, showed that there was improved functional outcomes, blood loss, quality of life, and better length of stay, and similar outcomes for fistula, delayed gastric emptying, and complications. There's also four more randomized control trials underway looking at this. So as you look at minimally invasive pancreatic, uh, pancreatic distals, um, as I said, it's the preferred approach. Most of us also feel it's safe for some pancreatic ductal. Here's a meta-analysis, and it looks at whether um, the robot or laparoscopic 
is any better. So if you intend to preserve the spleen as your goal for doing a distal pancreatectomy, the robot does actually work better. You have improved splenic preservation. You can see on the uh, chart here, the forest plot definitely does favor the robotic approach. You have less blood loss, lower length of stay. And what's very interesting is a lower conversion rate to open surgery. There's similar complications for OR time and fistula. There's really no difference between the two techniques. A group of surgeons got together in 2019 in Miami and came up with now, what's now known and published as the Miami Guidelines for Minimally Invasive Pancreatectomy. And what you can see under the area for distal or central pancreatectomy or left-sided pancreatectomy, it has a category one indication for benign and low-grade malignant tumors and should be considered over distal pancreatectomy because of these better outcomes. It can be used and seems to be feasible and safe for pancreatic ductal, but obviously people are looking for some randomized trial data to give that a higher um, recommendation. Everybody wants to know what's the perfect technique to divide the pancreas and how to avoid the fistulas. And what all of the evidence says right now is there is no one superior technique. It doesn't matter whether we put a device on the end of our staplers or we divide it in another way, we still get pancreatic fistulas. So no superior technique there. And that using both the lap, laparoscopic approach or robotic is indicated. And from a patient standpoint, there's really no contraindications to a minimally invasive resection, whether it's age, obesity, or abdominal surgery. So this really has become state of the art. So this is work that we just put together and submitted uh, to um, a meeting, which is looking at the premier health database, which is a large claims database that represents a fair portion of the United States and has good geographic representation through all of the regions. This is for pancreatic resection data, and it had over 10,000 patients in it, but the patients in this study are the ones that about the 64% where it's just for neoplasms. And what you can see here, it's very interesting, in 2016, open surgery finally falls below 50% and stays there. So minimally invasive surgery for, distal, uh, for left side resections has become the norm in America starting in 2016. Open surgery, you had higher rates of splenectomy. Using sort of length of stay greater than 10 days as a surrogate for how bad of a complication a patient's having since your average length of stay for this is about four days, you see that open surgery had a higher extended length of stay, higher rates of blood transfusion, and overall length of stay that was greater. When you compare the laparoscopic to the robotics, what you see is that the rate of conversion, again, is substantially higher. So there's something assistive about the robotic technique that is um, facilitating, in, for many people, um, the distal pancreatectomy. So in conclusion, what I learned in putting this talk together, everything old is new again. I had no clue that in the late 19th century, they were doing splenic sparing pancreatectomies. I thought that was something that was invented in the 20th century, that all of this stuff was being done and we're just doing it differently. Distal pancreatectomies started off as treatment of neoplasms. It got sidelined for many years with sort of just treating these hormonally active uh, neuroendocrine tumors and cystic neoplasms, and basically pancreatitis. That became the premier indication for this operation. Then through imaging advances, neoadjuvant treatment, there's really been a reinvigoration for left-sided pancreatectomy for cystic lesions, adenocarcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors. And at this point, I think we can say that the minimally invasive approach should be the primary approach for most tumors, as long as you have the capabilities and the equipment. And again, if you have the capabilities and equipment, I would say that robotics does have an advantage over this. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. We taking questions?
We probably have time for one or two questions. Yeah, so in this uh, data set, I didn't show the Whipple data. So, so if you look at, we did the same analysis for pancreatic oduodenectomies. It is very confined to some centers. It has never hit more than 6% of pancreatic oduodenectomies being done, and that's combining both robotic and laparoscopic into sort of a single minimally invasive component. Also, the frequency has not stabilized. The way you see distals really kind of stabilizing into this minimally invasive and that growing in the data set, it just sort of changes. It goes from like 2% up to about 6%. And it, it requires, in my opinion, two well-trained surgeons. You have to have a well-trained surgeon at the bedside. So for my practice, I've stopped doing uh, robotic Whipples because it's sort of my job in my program to train our PGYA4 residents how to do a Whipple. The moment I turn that into a robotic operation, I can really no longer meaningfully involve a PGY4 resident in that operation because your risks are higher and the dissections. So, you know, there's a number of centers. There's a center in Florida doing many, uh, Colorado, Pittsburgh, we're doing them. I mean, there's centers that are doing it, but I don't see it really taking off the way that minimally invasive distals. What's also interesting is that the complications, length of stay and everything are not any better. You know, when you look at a Whipple, what's gonna keep your patient in the hospital is your complications. The thing that you've not seen reported yet in large data is, does it get you to your adjuvant chemotherapy quicker than perhaps an open? So I think in the right candidate, in the right center, it can certainly be done. Where that role is gonna be, not sure yet. Please introduce yourself and say where you're from and then ask the question. Sunil Gievergeese from Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Ram, spectacular talk. Really love the way you built the historical review directly in with the technological advances, particularly for our house officers and students. Question about the progression of experience to competency and particularly the learning curve for robotics. As I look at that video by Dr. Visser, it's spectacular. It looks just effortless. It's beautiful. But how long does it take to get someone to there and ultimately number of cases or is it hours on the simulator? How does that work? I think that there's a really good program if people are interested in learning robotic Whipples by Melissa Hogue, who's really put a lot of time and effort when she was in Pittsburgh and she's in Chicago now, like kind of defining these learning steps. I think the number is debatable. What's your previous robotic experience coming into it? You know, I started robotics in 2006. I did not extend into pancreas for years though. And so I think for a kind of fresh trainee, our trainees are getting more robotics experience in their programs now. All of our residents are graduating with their robotics certification. Um, I've seen the learning curve described as everything as short as probably around 15 and as high as 50. I don't know what that number is. And I think it's gonna be like many things, an individualized number. But practicing, obviously, with the um, simulator, working in concert with somebody, especially for your first operations, who is a skilled bedside person or dual counsel. We do all of our operations on dual counsel. It really allows us to also teach. And I love as the attending that I have that safety stop, where as long as I press the camera pedal down, I can disconnect somebody from operating further which sometimes, unfortunately, you really have to do as it begins to get a little dicey. So I think robotics is here to stay. There's a new robot that's actually commercially becoming available. It's out. Robotics is going nowhere, and I expect to sort of see just more and more things moving into that area.
Sherry, Manny Zeros from East Carolina University. That was a fantastic talk on distal pain explain. And I'm embarrassed to say that um, I know you better socially than professionally. And I didn't appreciate your perspective where you're coming from, but from an HPB perspective, I think uh, I find it, and it's an appropriate comment, that I think that the spleen preserving um, distal pancreatectomy was really facilitated by uh, uh, HPB surgeons doing Warren Shunt. Dean Warren, who was obviously chair of this department for many years, but the meticulous dissection of those branches, the splenic vein off the pancreas, uh, really made it. Um, what would seem otherwise un impossible or not feasible made it uh, in a different disease process has facilitated that. And like you said, what's old is new again. So uh, it's interesting um, um, seeing the advances here that are coming from different specialists. Yeah, I think the more we all work together, you know, it's interesting. I did a lot of my training in Pittsburgh, was highly influenced by transplant then moved into the HPV world. And these are really fields that we all belong together as well as surgical oncology. And each of us sort of brings something to the table. And I think a lot of us would, you know, say that that cross-pollination has made this a better field for everybody. I think one last oh. question. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I kind of have what I call my bipolar life. I have in the United States, I have a $2 million robotic system. We just bought another robot. And um, then I also do this humanitarian and global work. It is my absolute bipolar life. Um, 2006, there, I decided to look at, there was two competing techniques. And for the younger people in the audience, technical advances are going to come. And you're going to have to make a decision whether you adopt a technical advance. So there were two new technical advances. There was robotics, and then there was the notes, no scar, taking things out endoscopically, you know, the whole cholecystectomy through the vagina, appendectomy through the stomach. And it was, there was a lot of talk about this. There was conferences. I see Barry and Abbott. Yeah, we remember those days. And I evaluated, you can't, learning two new techniques is really tough, right? And so I looked at it and I sort of made what I thought was my best educated um, guess as to which technique was going to have more viability. And I would say that I guessed right. I mean, yes, they still have no scar things and there's still people doing it. I think POEM was the first knock it out of the park you know, endoscopic treatment, but it's an interesting thing. I was influenced by the fact that I saw some of my attendings as a resident when laparoscopy come in, refused to learn it, and they got left by the side of the road. So for all of you young trainees, evaluate the tech, look at it, adopt it. I never regretted being an early adopter, and it's been an exciting ride. So thanks. I'm presenting this plaque here, Southeastern Surgical Congress, Arthur Hamlin Lenton Lecture, Sherry Wren, 2021. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.